places. Mm -hmm. So most of the speakers that I deal with, they would rather be here rather than do Dempsey and they have their own reasons. But today we have Hakeem Bey who will be speaking on Northgate civilization. But before we begin with Hakeem Bey, before he gets here, we have Brother Sharif Bey, a special treat from Syracuse, New York, Brother Sharif Bey. <laughs> Can I sit over at the table? Sure. Can I use the table? All right. <clears throat> Again, as the brother said, my name is Sharif Bey. I'm um, acting head of Moore Science Temple of America, study group number five in Syracuse, New York. Um, I've spoken a number of times here before. We're not here in this, in, in this you know, theater, right at this location, but um, over the Dempsey Center. Talked about a number of different things. My last lecture was entitled Moorish Jurisprudence. Um, the uh, definition or the explanation of the word jurisprudence is the science of positive law. In other words, why law works the way it does. Any of you that have taken law courses or have been in law school know that you don't learn jurisprudence until the last year, most likely the last semester of your um, legal education in law school. There's a reason for that. Again, jurisprudence is the science of positive law. In other words, why things work the way they work in relation to law. The, analog the analogy is like, um, or an analogy is like myself giving you a wrench, or someone giving you a wrench and saying, break down an engine, break down a car engine. You're not going to be able to do it. You'll be ill-equipped because you have no understanding of why or how the engine works. You don't know anything about combustion um, mechanics. So the best way, or the, a better way to do it is to teach you the hows and whys of combustion engines, how they work, why they work, the principle behind it. Then I can give you the wrench, and you can take apart the engine. So that's what jurisprudence is. Jurisprudence is the science of law, why it works the way it works. All right, as opposed to a lot of the legal jargon that a lot of us get and that we call law. Case law, you know, these things. These are the tools, these are the working tools. But without knowledge of the science of how it operates as a whole, then the tools are just that. You know, we don't know the uses of them. All right, so I'm gonna go into some, actually what I'm gonna deal with today, and very briefly, is I'm going to keep things locked on the prophet, on Prophet Noble Drew Ali. All right? First, one of the first things I'm going to speak about is why we call him a prophet. And then I'm going to go into some history about this man that most of us do not know. One of the reasons why the Moorish movement is so fragmented and there's so many misconceptions and, and confused ideas is because, as Prophet Drew Ali said it, that some people want their salvation their own way. They want it their own way. And they'll have it their own way if they can. You know, rather than to listen first and then act second. So, as a result of not having adequate information available, People naturally try to find their own ways. Like, all right, well, um, the prophet says nationality is the order of the day. Why is nationality so important? Well, we don't take the time a lot of times to study why nationality is important, so we end up doing what? We end up taking somebody else's nationality, assuming somebody else's nationality, making up a nationality without full knowledge of what Drew Ali did, how he did it, and why he did it. See, again, we want to be A students. We don't want to be F students. And I don't mean in terms of training like what most of us think education is today. Most of us take education as training because that's what it is. You know, education is you finding things for yourself and asking the questions why, who, where, and how. That's real education. You get it yourself. That's actually analogous to initiation. Because initiation, for those of us that know, is tr the start of true education. Because the start of true education isn't compulsory. It's not, it's not mandatory. They say reading is fundamental, but understanding isn't. It's not mandatory for you to have to get a real education. See, the regular school district says it's mandatory for you to go to school from the age, up to the age of 16, New York State, right? That's mandatory. 
But that's not education. That's training. That's training. It's easy to prove that one. Training prepares you to do a particular thing. So we can tell, I don't even have to go to the school system or the training institute to tell what type of training or the, what training it, ha it is. All I have to do is look at the effects of the people that went through it, right? So if you went through a training institution or you went through, let's say, the, 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 the public school system, and as a result, we as a people are still social and economic slaves. What did it train you to be? It's nothing emotional, that's exactly what it trained you to be. Now, if the average European goes through the exact same process and he does what? He owns businesses that we work for and he passes those businesses on to his children and to his offspring, they inherit those things and you're only as good as your last day at work. So when you have children, your children start from ground zero working for the man who passes on his business to his child, so your children end up social and economic slaves to his children, we know the purpose of that training for him, right? We see where he is. So that's why, that's why I said education is not necessarily mandatory or compulsory. Education is something you have to find. Now those of us that are familiar with initiation know the first step to real education. Does anybody here know? The first step to real education is ask. Am I right? The first step to education is you ask. You ask a question. In the Bible, those of us that are religiously minded, Jesus said what? Knock. You ask. Ask for admission. All right? That's the first stage of education. So going, you know, that was an elaborate way of saying, you know, in, in shedding light on being an A student as opposed to an F student. We want to ask the right questions. Well, if this man named Drew Ali in 1913, what, what possessed him in 1913 to pop up with the first temple of Islam since the formation of the Union States of America? Why in the world did he do that? What possessed him to do that? What drove him to do such a thing? See, these are the questions we have to ask. If we don't ask these questions, we won't know why he did what he did. We won't know why we're doing what we're doing now. And we'll continue in the confusion we have. We'll continue in it. You know? I mean, it, 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 you know, we'll continue in the confusion. And what the prophet brought us was unity. Let me go into the issue of prophethood. What, makes a, what is a prophet? Does anybody know? I want to be kind of interactive here. There's not a lot of people here. Yes, sir. It brings a particular message to a people that's either oppressed Mm. Mm. I agree with that. I agree with that. A prophet is a messenger. A prophet, as we say, is a thought of Allah clothed in flesh. His purpose is to deliver a message to a particular people, right? Now, you have many of us, many other people of other nationalities, you know, for instance, Arabs, that will tell you, you're not Muslim, you're not a Muslim, you don't practice Islam, you follow that man Drew Ali, you say he's a prophet, how is he a prophet? And how you say you're Islamic and say he's a prophet, right? They'll say Muhammad of 1400 years ago was the last prophet. Well, what makes a prophet? We say that Drew Ali, we know that Drew Ali in formulating or putting together or divinely preparing our Holy Quran, the Morris Science Temple of America, we know that he derived his information from a number of other sources. People will try to use that. They'll say, hey, well, he got it from the Aquarian Gospels. Is that true? Did he get this information here from the Aquarian Gospels? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. How do we know? Again, we got to be A students. If all we know is the Aquarian Gospels and we just stop right there, then we'll fall victim to that. And we'll be doing exactly what he said in here, following after the strange gods of Europe of whom we know nothing of. Leaving our own nationality, our own vine and fig tree and going under somebody else's, namely Arab. All right? The man who wrote the Aquarian Gospels, Levi Dowling, got his information from the same place Drew Ali got his. I gave you some history to go find it. You can go find it yourself. The name of the book was called Infinite Wisdom. 
That was the name of the book. Now you find research on that book, you'll find out where that book came from. All right? Now, Arabs, other Muslims, a lot of our own people will say, well, okay, well, he got it from books. He wasn't divine. It was not divinely prepared. He got it from another book. He plagiarized, right? Well, let's look at the Prophet Muhammad. Anybody here study Islam, practice Orthodox Islam, familiar with Orthodox Islam? The Prophet Muhammad, when he, was, when he was called to be a prophet by the angel Jibril, who was described as a man, the angel Jibril commanded him to do something. Does anybody know what that commandment was? Every Muslim knows that the angel Jibril commanded the prophet Muhammad to read. He said it three times, read. Well, what did he read? Again, we exercise our five senses as Moors, especially as new Moors, so we don't take anything on face value. Now, a lot of Orthodox Muslims would have you think that he was talking about reading nature. He was in a cave, what was he gonna read? Spiders crawling on the wall? Come on. What did he read? He read a book. The Prophet Muhammad read a book. This is stated later on, please, later on in Hadith and also other places in the Quran where he's faced with certain social issues or certain social problems with his nation. And he had to go back into a deep state of meditation to remember what he read. So was that any different from what Drali did? Not at all. The Quran, second chapter, Quran of Mecca, second chapter, 285th verse, states that we sent not a prophet but to every nation speaking their language. So in brief, as far as on this topic, anybody that tells you that, for instance, Drew Ali was not a prophet to our people here, is just saying in a polite way that y'all are niggas and you don't deserve someone to come to you and speak to you in your own language. That's all that is. That's all it is. What? The so-called Jews can have somebody come to them, right? The Arabs the, the, can have somebody come to them as well. Well, you can't, when your condition's 10 times worse. And their own Quran states that that's what happened. Somebody has to come speaking your language from amongst your own people, why? Very simple. If somebody came speaking Arabic, you'd have it a good excuse. I don't know Arabic, right? We know that certain things in terms of language are not directly translated from one language to another. So you'd always have an excuse. I don't know that, I don't know Arabic. This man, he doesn't come from the streets. We, he don't come from the neighborhood I come from. He doesn't understand what I've been through. Good excuse. So I just dealt with that briefly as far as the prophethood. I mean, I can go even further as far as defending the prophethood of Drew Ali. Secondly, what did he establish? We know about the organization, More Science Temple of America. We've heard the name. We don't know exactly what it is. We don't know exactly the purpose of it being set up. Most of us know, oh, it's a religious institution. All right. Any of us know what happened May 1st, 1916 with Drew Ali? Anybody? What did he do in 1916? Let that simmer for a second. Let's go to national requirements. Drew Ali declared us a nation, 1928, openly and publicly declared us a nation of people. He took one Asiatic sister, one Asiatic brother, young children, wrapped our flag around them, and officially declared us a nation, 1928. So we're a nation of people. What is required of people who are part of a nation? What is required to be in a nation from the individual? Does anybody know? I'm sorry, ma'am? That's a part of it, yes, ma'am. Definitely, definitely, to have your own social structure. What else? What are basic requirements to be recognized by the other nations of the earth? Yes, sir? Flag. A flag, definitely. A constitution. Anything else? Okay, a seal, right? Land, a land mass. That's very important. 
because the word nationality deri is derived from the word nation, which is derived from the word natal, which is derived from mother. What part of Mother Earth can you claim as your own by right? What else is required? See, because also, too, I mean, those are natural things, but there's also procedural things. It's not just a matter of me popping up saying I'm Moorish American. It ain't that simple. We lost our nationality in 1774, 1779. How? Because the European just said, you're not Moors no more? No, you went through a process. So there's a process to be recognized by the other nations of the earth as an upright individual that's a member of a nation. One of them is this, two things. You, when, when the Europeans come over here, when the Ellis Island was open, and even now when that is not open, they have to do, they're forced to do two things. They have to declare two things. Anybody know what those two things are? Yes, sir. What's the other thing? The first thing they have to declare is their nationality. The second thing is what? Their divine creed. You are forced to declare these two things to be recognized by any nation anywhere in the world. Those two things. You are forced to. More Science Temple of America's Divine Constitution and Bylaws, Act Number Six. With us, all members must proclaim their nationality, and we are teaching our people their nationality and their divine creed, that they may know that they are a part and a partial of this said government, and know that they are not Negroes, colored folks, black people, or Ethiopians, because these names were given to slaves by slaveholders in 1779 and lasted until 1865 during the time of slavery. But this is a new era of time now and all men must proclaim their free national name to be recognized by the government in which they live and the nations of the earth. Very powerful. Now, those two things have to happen to be recognized. Anybody familiar with Dr. Ralph Bunch? A little bit. One of our brothers, great man. Anybody familiar with what he did or what he was involved in with the, um, um, not the United Nations, at the time it wasn't called the United Nations, it was called what? League of Nations, prior to the Bretton Woods Agreement, right? It was called the League of Nations. Anybody know that he actually spoke at the League of Nations in 1912? Does anybody know that? Actual fact, he spoke. The League of Nations in 1912 was brought there by the president, President Woodrow Wilson. Does anybody know what happened? Well, obviously not if you don't know that he, that he spoke. Do you know what happened? The ambassador to Japan stood up and addressed President Woodrow Wilson and addressed the U.S. ambassador and addressed everyone there and said this, how dare you bring a slave to speak in front of nations. And they walked out. And other nations and their ambassadors walked out. Question, were they racist? Were they racist? Anybody think so? You think so? Absolutely not. They were not racist at all. They were not racist at all. They understood what the prophet said in 1913, and what we still say today, that nationality is still the order of the day. Still. Question, in the present day, can a bum, for lack of a better use of the term, not to be derogatory amongst our homeless, I'll just say it that way, can a homeless man go and speak at city council or the chamber of commerce? Can he? On the behalf of, quote unquote, I mean, he can. Is he? Are the members there? Notice I use the word members. Are the members there bound to recognize him? Today. Period. Can you go? I'm sorry, ma'am? Can you go? Can I go? Yeah, you go. Oh, I wouldn't dare go. But my point is, why would he not be recognized? 
Why? Not necessarily. He's not a member. He's not a part. Remember, citizen means what? Member. That's what the word citizen means. It means member. So, the prophet said it himself. In the deliberation of nations, remember, what are we? Are we just a group of black people? Or are we a nation? What are we? We're a nation. The prophet said this. In the deliberation of nations, no consideration is given a people that are not part of a nation. What part of a nation was Dr. Ralph Bunch a part of? What, what nation was he a part of? What nation was he a part of? Dr. Ralph Bunch was not a part of a nation. Dr. Ralph Bunch, unfortunately, did not honor his mothers and fathers. He did not worship under his own vine and fig tree, so he would not be recognized. He would not be respected. That is law, international law, no matter where you go in the world. It wasn't a race issue. They realized the man did not belong to the League of Nations. He didn't belong to a nation, period. He didn't. That was the problem. Now, what is the profit figure in, in all of that? I still have the issue of 1916. Still keep that in your head. One of the biggest accomplishments of Prophet Drew Ali, many of us may have heard of it, but we don't know details on it. What did he do in 1928? Does anyone know? Form some sort of trust. Yeah. Um, kind of, kind of. We'll get to that. In 1928, yes, sir. Say that, could you say that louder again? Uh, he went to the uh, Pan American Conference in Cuba. Yes, sir. He went to, was invited and went to the sixth Pan American Conference held in Havana, Cuba. Anybody heard of that before? Anybody know what the Pan American Conference was about? Again, like I said, we have to be A students. There's nothing wrong with not knowing, but once now you know a little something, you have to go and find out for yourself. We're taught that man knows not by being told. See, I could be sitting here lying to everybody. Man knows not by being told. Man must be that which he or she knows. You have to be it. So let's go back to the conference. What was the conference about? Who is familiar with the Monroe Doctrine? Dealing with matters of law here. Who knows what the Monroe Doctrine was or is? We have to know these things. The Monroe Doctrine is dealing with all of the American states, all of the nations in the Americas, all right? The basic premise of the doctrine is an attack to one American nation is perceived as an attack to every American nation. All right? So, but what was happening is that the US, or the U period, S period, Union States, was using that as very one-sided. So that they could quarter troops in every other American nation, but nobody could come to the US. You see what I'm saying? So the Amer Pan American Conferences were to try to iron a lot of this stuff out. It also included treaty law violations especially the sixth annual Pan American Conference. I guarantee you, you'll go and you'll look up the sixth Pan American Conference and you won't find it. You'll find the fifth and the seventh, but you won't find the sixth, not directly. But if you wanna find it, take the indirect route. Look up information on the Monroe Doctrine. Look up authors that are Latin in origin and you'll get what you're looking for. S former Secretary of State Hughes was present at this meeting. Prophet Drew Ali was present, but the significance is that the only people that were allowed to address were, guess what? Representatives of nations and heads of state. So what, what? you mean to tell me that a so-called American Negro actually acted as an official head of state on our behalf? Yes, it's a matter of history. Find it yourself. Well, how was he able to do that? 
How was he able to do it? Well, to be a head of state, you gotta be a head of a nation, right? How was Drew Ali considered and, and recognized officially as a head of nations and called at the conference an Islamic prince? How, how did that happen? What did he do? Let's go back to 1916. First of all, to be a nation, you gotta have what? To be a recognized nation, we said a flag. Do we have a flag? Absolutely. What flag is that? Old glory? Yes or no? Yes, yes sir, absolutely. Old glory. Is old glory the stars and stripes or the Star Spangled Banner? Absolutely not. Old glory is the oldest flag in this hemisphere. Over 10,000 years in the Americas. That flag is the flag that Dick Gregory spoke of when he was interviewed on C-SPAN. Did anybody see that besides me? Please, somebody tell me they saw it. Dick Gregory and Russell Simmons were being interviewed on C-SPAN dealing with um, the whole um, march with Al Sharpton down in D.C. for police brutality. And somebody phoned in and asked him about um, a lecture he had done talking about John Hansen. And he said, well, could you elaborate on that? Well, Dick Gregory proceeded to talk about John Hansen being the first president of the United States. We've spoken on that before in a few other lectures. Is everybody familiar with that? George Washington was not the first president. All it takes is basic mathematics to figure it out. They tell you in grade school that he was inaugurated president in 1789, but the U period, S period, declared themselves independent in 1776. So who was president between 1776 and 1789? When George Washington was still a general fighting the war against us, right? It takes just simple mathematics. You figure out somebody else was the executive ruler. And it was John Hanson. Well, he spoke about the fact that John Hanson looked like us, which he did, and that there were seven more after John Hanson, and George Washington was the ninth, which is why they say at nine years old, he chopped down the cherry tree. We know what the cherry tree is. The cherry tree is our flag, old glory. And that was declared, and that's an act of war anytime you chop somebody else's flag down. But the Akeem has spoken on that numerous times. But that flag is a red, cherry red flag with a green five-pointed star in the center. All right? Dick Gregory actually spoke on this nationwide. I was shocked. Not because he knew it, but I was shocked that they were allowing it to be said on national television. On C-SPAN, no doubt. Okay? He even spoke further. He said, yeah, the Moors were here before the Pilgrims. They helped the Pilgrims set up the 13 colonies. He said all of this on TV. I was hoping somebody else saw it and taped it because I'd like a copy of it. But anyway, Prophet Drew Ali spoke as a head of state, an official head of state. The only way you could be a head of state and speak as a head of state or a national representative is if you're the head of a nation. As if you're a head of a nation. All right? What did he set up? Let's go back to 1916. May 1st. Those of us that are in the Moorish Science Temple of America or familiar that have a Holy Quran of the Moorish Science Temple of America, an official one. What I mean by official is that you have, you can't see this, but you have two seals. One of the seals says Moorish Science Temple of America, which we know is a religious institution. The other seal says Moorish Divine National Movement, May 1st, 1916. Whoa, what did he do in 1916? Does anybody know? Let's find out what he, said, what he said himself. This is a warning from the prophet, 1928. Friday, November 30th. I, the prophet, was prepared by the great God of law to warn my people to repent from their sinful ways and go back to that state of mind of their forefathers' divine national principles, that they will be law abiders and receive their divine right as citizens according to the free national constitution that was prepared for all free national beings. They are to claim their own free national name and religion. There is but one issued for them to recognize by this government and of the earth, and that comes only through the connection of the Moorish divine national movement, which is incorporated in this government and recognized by all other nations of the world. And through it, they and their children, 
can receive their divine rights unmolested by other citizens. You who doubt whether I, the prophet, and my principles are right for the redemption of my people, go to those that know the law in the city hall and among the officials in your government and ask them under intelligent tone and they will be glad to render you a favorable reply. Well, first of all, before we can ask that question, we have to know what he did. We can't ask them in an intelligent tone anything if we don't know what the prophet brought. All right? But anyway, 1916, he incorporated the Moorish Divine National Movement. That is the Moorish government. Many of us don't know that. We don't know. So we had an operative structural government in place. Now you have empty seats, you gotta fill them. So we have what? He said, money doesn't make the man. It is free national standards and power that make a man and a nation, right? So the free national standards comes from two things. Number one, nationality. Number two, divine creed. We have to show that we are upright and pure people. You just don't let, a, you don't let some criminal into your home, do you? Absolutely not. So we have to know that our people are upright. So it's not just a matter of saying, well, this is my divine creed. We have to be practicing, all right? We have to be practicing. So. That's what free national standards are. The second thing, power. Where's the power come from? Say it again. Absolutely. 1925, the prophet publicly declared he was a prophet and got to work. Between 1925 and 1928, the man opened up, or basically from 25 to 28, had 15 branch temples. 21 subordinate temples, and over 100,000 members in 1928, in a three-year span. That's power. There's nations on the planet right now that are bona fide nations that have a seat at the United Nations that don't have 100,000 people. That's a fact. So now you know why the man was considered an official head of state. And more importantly, the brother here mentioned something about a trust, right? Those of you, anybody know about law, we know basically, let's say, let's say inheritance, trust law, a will. When you have something to be inherited, what is one of the ways, just very basic and simple, if you have an inheritance coming to you, how can you actually disqualify yourself from the inheritance? Anybody? How? Get out of the name. What's your last name, sir? Lopez. Lopez? If you were my father and you had an inheritance for me and I disowned the name Lopez and claimed some other name, can I get the inheritance? Right? No. So what do I have to be to get it? I got to come back into the name, right? I have to come back into the name. That's what I have to do. Understand? It's what we call in legal terminology, impropria persona. Anybody know what that means? What does it mean, sir? I always thought that meant that you were speaking on your own behalf. Um, not quite. It's been misinterpreted that way because of people using it in court. They don't understand the actual meaning of it. Impropria persona is Latin for in your proper person. Not for myself, I am myself. That's what that means. You have to be in your proper person. The prophet said this, you will not get by me this time. What did he mean? You will not get out of this thing being other than yourself. Plain and simple. 